So today I'm continuing the series on catechesis for the a different wording that will be used in the Mass beginning the first Sunday of Advent. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about where these changes came from, what, what is driving these changes. And to begin that, I want to read a quote from Pope Benedict XVI. He says, Many will find it hard to adjust to unfamiliar texts after nearly 40 years of continuous use of the previous translation. The change will need to be introduced with due sensitivity, and the opportunity for catechesis that it presents will need to be firmly grasped. I pray that in this way, any risk of confusion or bewilderment will be averted, and the change will serve instead as a springboard for a renewal and a deepening of Eucharistic devotion all over the English-speaking world. So, why is this change needed? As the Pope himself said, we've been using it for the last, you know, uh, several decades. Why would we need to change it now? And why does any change ever need to be made to the Mass? I mean, don't we celebrate exactly the same Mass that they did at the very first one, one week after the resurrection? Well, there are probably some people that believe that. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, uh, after studying the liturgy for decades now, that is not quite the case. Um, however, I will say this. The structure and intention of the Mass has never changed from day one. Uh, the structure being you know that there's going to be readings from the scripture. You know that there's going to be a Eucharistic prayer over bread and wine. You know that that is going to be distributed. That has remained constant throughout all time uh, since Jesus. But the incidentals have developed over time. And sometimes it's necessary to do a little house cleaning. Um, so I'm going to talk first about um, the Mass that some of you knew before Vatican II, which you experienced. I never really did experience it because I was born a month after the close of the Second Vatican Council. Okay, so I'm a Vatican II baby. And while I've seen the Tridentine Mass, I, I mean, it's not in my, my bones like it is in some folks because that's what you were raised with when you were young. So where did the Tridentine Mass, that is the Mass that happened before Vatican II, where did it come from? It was promulgated in the year 1570 at the Council of, as, a, as a result of the Council of Trent, which, ha which happened in the mid to late 1500s. And they were trying to uh, kind of bring some uniformity to the Mass as it was being celebrated, mostly in Europe at the time. Uh, because it really hadn't spread a whole lot beyond there. Um, well, maybe some African things were happening, but um, this, there was a, one of the decisions made at the, at the uh, Council of Trent was that they would standardize the Mass, because they noticed that in different parts of Europe, there was different things being done. So they, um, they promulgated the Mass, which we now know as the Tridentine Mass, and that was pretty much operative up until the time of the Second Vatican Council. But you need to know this. Uh, after 1570, until the Second Vatican Council, there were changes made to that as well. Now, you weren't there to witness that. Unless you studied it, you wouldn't know that. Uh, but, yes, about 34 years after 1570 was the first big set of changes that were made. Um, corrections and just lots of things thrown together. 30 years after that, another major set of changes hit. And then over the centuries, small things happened. Like, for instance, when you declare a new saint, you have to have a feast day for that saint, right? So something gets added to the Mass, at least to the... Uh, liturgical schedule, let's say, because you've got to have a day on which to celebrate that saint's day. So changes like that, um, 
all, all kinds of other reasons. And incidentally, I need, I need to say this also. At the Council of Trent, they actually considered going to the vernacular language back then. Did you know that? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, why was, why was the Mass ever done in Latin? Do you know that? We're, we're fairly certain the first Mass was not done in Latin. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm a, 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 two pastor's columns from now, I, I'm going to explain why we're almost sure of that. But why did we switch to Latin at any point? Because that's what the language that the people spoke in Europe. In Western Europe, Latin was the language of the day that you used in your everyday speech. So let's say the first Mass was in Greek, which is a possibility. They would have had to have some, at some point switched to Latin so that the people could understand the Mass. But it stuck to Latin for a long, long time. Now, at the, at the Council of Trent, um, like I said, they really did consider putting the vernacular because by that time, by the 1500s, um, Latin had degenerated into five different languages um, by, that, by that time. You know, Latin had combined with the local language of certain areas to form a new language. Language forms and changes over time, right? Someone doesn't write a textbook about how language should be spoken and then everyone has to keep to that. Language changes over time. Um, and so in this case, Latin degenerated into the, the five Romance languages that we now know. Italian, Spanish, Romanian, French. What's the other one? Uh, no, not German. Portuguese. But Portuguese. Portuguese is the fifth Romance language. Okay, so that process happened over time, slowly. We, we kept with the Latin. I mean, the church doesn't, you know, go with every latest thing going on in society. We kept with the Latin, but at a certain point, it was recognized, you know, maybe we should, um, again, put the Mass into the vernacular, that is, the language that people speak. So um, they contemplated that at the Council of Trent. And as I said, the Council of Trent began... Um, in the 15, let's say the mid-1500s. Can you think of a reason why the fathers of the church of that time would have rejected that idea um, because of some things going on at the time? Can you think of anything? The Protestant Reformation had begun in 1517. In fact, the Council of Trent was called mostly to deal with the fallout of the Protestant Reformation. And so um, when Luther came out and said, if you say a Mass in Latin, it's, it's invalid. Yeah, I mean, you can't say a Mass in, in a language that people don't understand. Luther was very much against keeping with Latin. And so the church felt a need to step back from that proposition and say, okay, we need to stick with this for a bit longer. Now, it just so happens they stuck with it for 500 more years. Okay. Uh, so, but all along, there were little changes in the Mass that, that crept in. This is how things work. You know, uh, society itself doesn't change overnight. There's a series of things that happens. And then 30 years later, you look back and you, and you see, ah, some changes have taken place in how people think and how they dress and how they raise their children, the, their whole thought on marriage. That stuff changes over time. The same thing with liturgy. Um, and so those changes uh, crept into the liturgy, some things that duplicated other things, uh, uninformed things sometimes happened. And so at the, the Second Vatican Council, um, the church decided to clean house a little bit. You got to do that every 400 years or, you know, you have a really dirty house. So um, what do they do? They get the best scholars that are known available on the subject of liturgy and other subjects too, they get them together and they, they look back and they say, how was the Mass celebrated in the year 150, as far as we know? How was it celebrated in 300? How in 700? And so forth. And they start comparing notes. 
You know, why did this change to that? And they start hooking things up together and they say, okay, this is the Mass that we've been celebrating for the last, let's say, 500 years. Some of the things in it need to be rearranged to more um, um, correspond with what the Mass was originally intended to be. Okay, because, you know, things tend to go a little bit off course sometimes. That's why you need to clean house. And so that's what they did. They started, they, they started finally saying, okay, the vernacular thing we talked about at Trent, we need to do that. We need to just do it. Um, and then other things like, you know, the priest before Vatican II, his back was facing you most of the time. Um, through their liturgical studies, they saw that in many places in the world, uh, and this actually was a theory, they never actually proved this, but they thought that maybe the priest faced the people. And so that's one of the things they put in there. And they, they went through all of the sacraments and they did that. Now, when they do that, they come out with what they call an additio typica, meaning that it's always done in Latin. Always, always, always. All liturgies are done originally in Latin. We are the Latin church. We are the, rest, the Western uh, Latin Rite Church. So everything is always done in Latin first and then translated into the various vernacular languages. Well, at Vatican II, when, when the decision was made to, to make these changes, um, we hadn't translated the liturgy into a vernacular for over a thousand years. So they weren't... You know, it hadn't been done in so long, they weren't quite sure how to proceed in every way. But the, the bishops of the English-speaking parts of the world got together and they formed a committee called the International Committee on, Energy, on English in the Liturgy. And they said, because Britain speaks English and, and South Africa and um, some of Canada and, you know, all these other places... Let's pool our resources, get our scholars together, and do the work of translation together. And that's what they did. And most uh, language centers did that. Like, you know, all the places that speak Spanish, they all got together and did a vernacular translation and so forth. Well, at the time, though, the thing in vogue when you translated a text was something called dynamic equivalence. This is a a way of translating that says you can loosely translate what the thing says in hopes that the people of the time that you are translating for will understand it. Okay? So, you, in other words, you can have a little bit of uh, poetic license, if you will, with the text that you're translating as long as it makes it more understandable for the people of the time that you're translating for. Well, that is basically is what driving is what is driving uh, this new change. Not much has changed in the Latin since Vatican II. A little bit has changed for various reasons, uh, you know, four or five different reasons that I don't want to go into now. But the Latin did change a little bit, not much. Uh, what's really driving this new change of translation? Is, is exactly that, translation. Um, John Paul II never liked dynamic equivalence. And as a matter of fact, most translators, I'm told these days, I'm not a professional translator, but I'm told that most professional translators don't like it either. That the dynamic equivalence was not a very good road to go down for translation if you want um, accurate, very accurate translations. So, John Paul II wrote a, a letter uh, saying, I want to see in the future, down the road, uh, the, the liturgy to be retranslated from the Latin into whatever the vernacular is for your area, but not using dynamic equivalents, using something that is more a, a literal translation. Now, if you, if you know a lot of Latin and, and you, you're able to read the Mass in Latin, and then compare it to the English that we use, you will realize there are entire phrases left out. Okay? Uh, there are some things that, are, that were just plain translated wrong. 
<clears throat> like, for instance, before Vatican II, so you older folks, when the priest said, Dominus Vubiscum, what did you say? <laughs> Et cum spiritu tuo. That's not God's phone number. That is <laughs> the response to that. Okay, and what does that literally mean in English? Literally in English. Et cum spiritu tuo. It means literally, and with your spirit. Now, how did they get to, and also with you? Dynamic equivalence. That's the simple answer. I would uh, um, put forth to you that, and with your spirit, says something that with that, and also with you, does not say. And I'm going to get into that more in detail at a later homily. But that is what is driving this whole thing, the, the issue of uh, translation. Um, just a little bit about the, the work of the, the translators themselves. You know, once, once the Vatican comes out with the, the mass that they're going to go with, um, it's done in Latin, as I say. There are three copies of it made and put in the, the Vatican Library. Uh, which is quite extensive, if you know anything about that. And then they send those to the conference of bishops of the country that it's going to be used in and say, translate that. Okay, in our case, we use a committee called the International Committee on English in the Liturgy. That's who does our translating for us. And, and so they have been going through for the last, oh, five, six years and pouring through the, the Latin and saying, what is the best translation we can possibly get out of this? You know, knowing that, using dynamic equivalence, um, didn't always result in something um, exactly accurate. Okay, so that's, that's where we're really headed. Um, and so next week, I'm going to start talking about the actual changes themselves. What are they? I'm going to make maybe make some comments on each of the uh, differences and why they were made uh, so that we can understand that. And, you know, as I said before, last week, you know, there's going to be a little fumbling at first uh, because we're used to saying these texts for the last 40 or so years. I understand that. Um, but this is a better translation. And uh, I, I agree with that, especially after studying it myself. It is a better translation. There are things you will... Um, learn by saying the new words that maybe you hadn't realized. Even in the creed, for instance, in the Gloria, um, in the when the priest elevates the host. Uh, we're, I'll talk all about that. But it's it's going to be awkward at first. That's okay. Um, what in life that is of worth is easy. <laughs>